What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to an all new episode of the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You know my guest already, former Green Bay Packers guard, Panthers guard, Seahawks guard, tackle extraordinaire. Uh, you, you can follow him on Twitter at Mike Wall 68. My good friend, Mike Wall. Mike, how the heck are you doing? Doing well, Andy. We're just uh, commiserating about our coffee, caffeine needs in the after watching that film a couple of times. Yeah, I'm on. Uh, I had one energy drink and one soda so far as we're recording this, and it doesn't feel like anywhere near enough. Uh, <laughs> probably could use some alcohol mixed in as well as, as watching this tape. We have a lot to get to, and there's a lot of frustrations I think that are pent up, understandably so, from this game. A lot of mistakes that weren't learned from the first three quarters of Packers Saints that carried over into this one. I'm just going to give you the floor to start. We'll dig down into everything. I'm sure. What went wrong and why did it look as ugly as it did against the Lions last night? And actually, even though, you know what? Before we get there, I do want to tell you, I don't know if it's because we've been doing this for so long now. The voice of Mike Wall was in my head throughout the entirety <laughs> of that game last night because the process was bad. The mm. just the fundamentals were bad. And you talk about like trying to put together a successful, you know, team and just like the attention to detail, the blocking, the pad level, like all the stuff that it takes to win in the trenches. And I don't know, have more than 20 some yards rushing and not give up 200 plus yards rushing. It was just all not there. So before we even get to you, I just wanted to say, as we were watching that thing, all the stuff that you've been saying for the past year and a half was just buzzing through my mind as I was watching that game. But now I will give you the floor. Yeah, and which is kind of sad, right? Because that means that that usually means that something's gone gone terribly wrong. But yes, I can't. I just can't recall a time where you've given up 211 yards twice in three games. Yeah. Just to, like just start with that statement. I don't know since high school if I've been on a team that or been a part of an organization that did that. I mean, that's an yeah. insane amount of yardage to give up, and and for a professional football team with as many as much talent as you have on <clears throat> that side of the football in particular. You know, if you talk about last, if you talk about the Saints game and what we thought were the keys to victory coming into the Lions game based on the last three weeks, it was uh, win first down on defense. So, in other words, put Jared Goff in a situation where he can't do his pistol or under center play action pass. We yep. failed miserably there. They could do anything they wanted whenever they wanted because they averaged almost five yards of carry on first, or, you know, on any down. When you run the ball as well as they're running the ball, you can do literally whatever you want. The entire menu is open. Yep. That's tough. Uh, the second thing is you had to have answers for the individual play by guys on their defensive line and then also their run, their, their stunt and their, and, their, and their blitz game just for run defense. You, backside guys have to make cutoffs. Playside guys have to make the right calls. We didn't look like we did any of it. We lost no. individual matchups. We, watched, we lost double teams. You know, uh, poor Kirk Herbstreet's on there. And I don't know how much Kirk knows about offensive line play. Like, he knows a lot about football. But he messed up some offensive line stuff last night, and they started blaming Tucker Craft on trying to block uh, Ali McNeil. And you're just going, that's a back block. It's such a bad down block by by Zach Tom. He does such a bad job of getting into the B gap. That dude runs free like he like he like no like uh, Myers doesn't even want to block him. Yeah, it's just it's it's Keystone cops out there for a lot of this game, and the fact that Detroit came in and said, <clears throat> we're going to beat you with four defensive linemen. All game. We don't need to rush a single extra guy because we don't think you can hold up with Aiden Hutchinson, McNeil, and the company. And they were absolutely right. So they drop seven, take Jordan Love off his first read, sometimes his second. He's always on the back foot. He gets hit early and often. He actually had a ton of time to throw, relatively speaking. He's just not getting to his progressions because you can stop the screen at any amount of time, any number of times during the game, and they're just blanket coverage at the five yard mark or at the seven or at the 10 yard mark. So there's just so many bad things that are happening on that football team. And I want to maybe end with this part for the, my, my soliloquy here is, is Andy is I would, I would go to war with a lot of guys on that defense, but from schematically how they're teaching things, there's some, that is the softest, like philosophically, that is the softest defense that I have seen in a long time. And again, I'm not blaming the players for yep. that because I think you have some real good players on that team. And I also think you have some guys that maybe not are, are good, but want to be good or are playing hard. But whatever is happening between when they draw it up on the on the grease board 
and how they do it on the on film, man, there is a there is a vast gap between what should be and what is. Yeah, we were talking. There's so many things I want to get to with that, and I'm sure we're ho- hopefully we'll get to all of them. But um, you, you look at the attention to detail, the practice stuff. We were talking a little bit. Like I, I just through the first ten play, nine ten plays on offense right now. And just the attention to detail, it, it did not look like this team had practiced before on certain concepts. Like no doubt. the amount of times where even just like Love and his receivers aren't on the same page that on that final third down play on the third drive, you've got Dobbs that's going to come open wide over, you know, wide open over the middle mm-hmm. and Dobbs stops on the route. I'm not entirely sure why he stops. Love is having to throw off of his back foot anyway, because he has immediate pressure in his face, but Dobbs is going to come wide open through that window. That should, like, we can talk about the play calling and all that stuff all you want. If you're getting pressure, quarterback's throwing off his back foot, and quarterback and wide receiver aren't on the same page where quarterback thinks he's going to keep going and wide receiver stops for some reason, like, those are things that you need time in. I know it's a young team, but, like, those are the things that you have to practice over and over. The other thing that you mentioned and just sort of the, the general softness of how the team plays, and, again, not individual players, but the team as a whole, so many places I want to go with this. First of all, like the identity of this team is still a mystery to me. What they are, what they want to be, and what they are trying to be. That there's no, there's no keystone element on offense of like this is who Green Bay wants to be. We've talked about this in the past. I think they want to try to take advantage of mismatches. That sounds cool at times, but like you have to have something that you do incredibly well that you can just go to when you need something. And Green Bay doesn't have that. And part of that is the inability to run the football in any capacity, which just sort of breaks everything down. But on the defensive side, I'm sure they would love to be a defense that can live in nickel personnel and keep guys back and keep everything in front of them. But when you give up 200 yards in two out of three games and just can't stop the run at all, you're not having an identity on defense either. And just everything, it's like the... It's like the one Jenga block that holds everything in place. If you're just getting gashed up front, everything else falls down around it. So, like, I do think that this is a team that philosophically, how they have been put together, there's no mauler on that offensive line. There's there's just not. And I, we can talk about, like, well, Bakhtiari's out and Jenkins out. Even those guys, Bakhtiari's, they're not, yeah, they're not maulers. Like, there's not somebody that you are going to bo- go and be like, well, Trent Will- – and I know Trent Williams is an exception to an exception. He's a phenomenal player. But, but- there's a ton of guys like that in the National Football League that are exactly. just uh, – bring bring your lunch bill today, boys. It's going to be a long day. It's going to be a long – and the Lions had a handful of those guys. You know, a couple of those guys right on their offensive line that you could just run behind and you knew you were going to get some yards. Green Bay doesn't have that. And on defense, same thing. Like, Kenny Clark clearly going to be somebody that's going to be tough to move in the run game. But they lack guys in the front seven – that are punch you in the face. I'm just going to go and get off this block, get in the backfield, and there's nothing you're going to do about it. And you can, I, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm going on here, but I think you can live in a world with some of those things. But if you're going to be sort of that finesse running team and more of that, you know, finesse even defensive team, you have to have insane attention to detail. You got to make sure you're getting to your spots, playing with phenomenal technique, playing with speed, playing with intensity. And I don't see those things either. So it's just yeah. a lot at the moment. It really is, and it, there's <laughs> there's just so many things to talk about. So, so you're talking about Dobbs stopping on the route, okay? Well, th- if you if you watch that play, <clears throat> they run they run the out motion with, with Musgraves at the bottom of the screen, but they've they've got the two receivers so close into the to the right tackle that you run horizontally fast, like you speed out like McDaniel does yep. to stretch them ver- horizontally, so now you can play vertically. He's got the receiver, and then Musgrave goes out, and when but when the ball snapped, they're both like three yards away from the tackle. So when a leveraged cornerback, the 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 safety and the linebacker can cover all of them lickety split, super easy. They've done nothing to affect the leverage. The read isn't obvious, so Love sits there, looks at it, realizes he's got to get to his second guy, goes and waits for Dobbs to get in his window. He. He, he slows down because he thinks the ball's going to the other side, I'm sure, because you see that yeah. happening all the time. And now all of a sudden, like you said, he's throwing, it's a bad deal. So it's attention to detail and being a professional. You look on the defensive side, and something you just brought up. So they are undersized in a number of places when you bring in your backups in particular, right? We talked yep. about Hollins. We talked about Enig Barry. They're just not big guys. That's okay. If you want to be a team, that does the occasional, okay, we're going to slant to the right, we're going to slant to the left, we're going to drop the end, and we're going to bring the linebacker over the top. Then your linebackers have to fill holes. And we watched the, the Atlanta Falcons, 
the New Orleans Saints and the, and the Detroit Lions on, on film when previewing these shows, their linebackers fill holes and allow those other guys to get singled up. They take the double teams off. They just put their they put their defensive lineman in a position to make plays on second effort because they felt they they make the running back stop at the line of scrimmage or before the line of scrimmage. We don't play on their side of the ball unless we win an individual matchup at the defensive end or defensive tackle position. And I Quay Walker is going to be a great player, and he's got 47 tackles this year. He's got two tackles for loss, and the reason is he's like a catcher's mitt at the second level. He does not. He never, ever, ever, ever knocks somebody on his backside. He never knocks a lead blocker on his backside. He's always looking for open gaps. And when you do that, you can have 47 tackles. We've talked. If you're eight yards downfield, it doesn't matter. Yep. You might as well be playing safety. And until they figure that, until somebody, again, I think that guy's a tough player. I think he's a really good player. I think he's, in coaching, if you condone something, if you allow something, you might as well be coaching it. Yeah. So if if you've seen it over the course of now over a year, and it's not just him, but when you see certain things happening over over the course of over a year now, and you've given up 422 yards in two out of the, you know in, combined in the two of the last three games, if you're if it's happening, then you must be coaching it because you're you're sure as hell condoning it, and it just doesn't. It's it's a sad thing. For guys, again, I look at it from a player's perspective. You got some dudes on this team that want to be really good, and there is a huge gap, chasm between where they are and where they should be. You talked about in the past of even when this team was winning, you know, 13 games a season and things like that, just some of these things that started to pop up. One of the questions I have is you now have this younger, more inexperienced team. And I do feel like there were times, you know, with Matt LaFleur and, and just kind of this coaching staff where they had some kind of fun scheme elements and some things that they could throw on that were, and then we still see that from time to time. But it felt like you had kind of these really good players from sort of the Mike McCarthy era that were, you know, held over and your Kenny Clarks, your Aaron Rodgers, your Devontae Adams, your Bakhtiaris, Janky, we can go on and on. Like there was a really amazing core here. And a lot of those guys just knew sort of how to play already. Yeah. And, you know, you could call cool stuff and they would know how to run it and things like that. I do wonder if now, like, because even we saw that sort of like slip off last year as some of those, Devontae Adams is gone and you had to bring in some younger players. And now Aaron's gone and you had to bring in some more younger players. And now we're seeing this young team. And I do wonder if we were, even when we were seeing some of the coaching stuff and the lack of emphasis on certain areas of the game fall off when you had this 13 win team, is this the right group of coaches? Is this the right overall structure to coach a team that you need, like you need to bring these guys up from ground zero. Like they are not where they need to be as NFL players yet. And it does feel to me like, I'll put it this way. It feels like as a coach, sometimes you can either be and I, like a, a coach, like a, you're going to mentor players and you're going to show them how to do things right. Or you can kind of be a strategist. And I kind of have a feel a little bit more that this team is more of a strategy based team than a coaches. Like we need to fo function and focus this way on things. I just wonder if like when you have a team full of young players, if that is going to backfire sooner rather than later. I, I'll answer your question by asking you this one. Last All night, right. they, they, they screenshot Dan Campbell and Matt LaFleur. Yeah, on the screen at the same time. Let's say that both of these teams are following the me the demeanor of their respective coaches. Which one do you want in that? If that's the case, it's a. No, I mean, this is a no brainer for me. You yeah. know, and when you talk about, <clears throat> look, Matt's a really smart guy. I, I, I've never been in a meeting with him. You can just tell by the way he talks. I have nothing. Bad to say about his ability to put together a scheme, you know, to run that organization. But we've talked about this for years about the lack of de attention to detail yeah. that Aaron Rodgers, particularly with Devontae Adams, would make things look better than they are because of all of the, and this is what they're missing right now. Jordan Love gets up to the line of scrimmage. He doesn't do the zipper and tell a guy to run a different route. He doesn't have that, right? And you have no idea how important that was until you don't have it anymore. And now we're seeing it, right? You don't, yep. you don't make adjustments. They don't have, they don't have certain, there's even in the run game, 
you just see the lack of attention to detail in a number of things from a from remiking the, the linebacker to how they approach the backside hinge. You just see a lack of attention to detail. And I do believe that when it comes to coaching in the National Football League, when it comes to developing talent in the National Football League, what you are really there for as a developmental coach who's trying to win football games is you are trying to do two things. You are trying to put your players from a schematic standpoint in a position to be successful. And the second part of that that I think is the most important, that is you have to give them the tools to find success. And then it's on them. But it looks like if, – and if you don't do both, you might as well not do either. And for me, I don't know that we do a good job of the second one because it doesn't seem that way from a footwork standpoint, body position. Something – Zach Tom? Zach Tom's been good since day one. When he got drafted, I go, just wait. This guy's going to be a player real soon. I said that to you last year. He's yep. been good. Is he good because he's good? Is he good because uh, you know he, Stenovich comes into the line room and works on him every once in a while? I, I don't know. But when you look at the – the whole of this team, there's at least some positions, there's some rooms that are that are not getting the developmental work that they need. And I, I think it's fair too of just like we haven't seen anyone in the past few. I mean, maybe anyone's harsh, but like we just haven't seen some of these young, talented players take a significant jump in any you know any real way. Devontae Wyatt playing a little bit better this year than he did, I think, last year, but not in a significant way. Quay Walker playing a little bit better than I think he was last year, but not maybe the first round, you know, superstar that you were maybe hoping that he was going to be able to become. Like there's there's certain players that I do think are, are are playing better, but it's not at a high level. Like we just haven't seen the the sort of draft and develop ability that I think this team wanted to have and, and continues to want to have. I just I haven't seen the develop as much. We've seen the draft. I just I haven't seen as much of the develop. And I'd like to see a little bit more of it, frankly. Yeah, and it's it when you think about that idea of drafting and development, Green Bay Packers are famous for that. I mean, that's, yep. that's, that's the Ron Wolf motto. Um, in order to do that, you have to constantly, constantly be taking an audit of your performances and you constantly, you know, I, I just, it's identify, assess and correct, right? There's a process to do everything. You have to identify what's wrong. You have to assess what the kind of root cause issue of why things aren't happening the way you want them to happen is. And then you have to go about correcting them. You have to do a lot of that on your own outside of team practice. You have to do it before or after practice. You can do it in the weight room. Maybe it's a mobility issue, whatever it is. They don't have – it's clear that at the very minimum, they don't have that. They're missing that system. They don't have that person in each room or as a the performance director, whatever it is, that says, I'm identifying these things that you're not doing well. Your footwork's wrong. Your first step on the backside, the way you go into contact, your, your block protection, coming in and out of routes, whatever it is. You're struggling with some very basic things, fundamental things of this sport, and they're preventing you from finding the success that you want. Here's how we're going to fix them. They don't have that. And the problem with Andy, not to get on a soapbox, but the problem with guys coming into the league now is they're not learning that skill in college. We're taking all the best athletes that we can find. We're yep. putting them on the top teams. We're just teaching them how to run and you know, do certain things at a really, really fast pace. And then when they get to the pros, when everybody else is as fast as they are, everybody else is as tough as they are, and you got to figure out how to solve your own problems because you have you have issues, kids don't have that in their toolbox anymore. And if you don't have somebody to help along the way, man, it, it becomes an issue. Yeah, it really, really does. I think the other thing, too, is I think we know, Mike, that the, the NFL is very cyclical, and just as one thing becomes in vogue, then it swings back the other way, and it kind of can go back and forth in pendulum a little bit. But it, it felt like for a while that, you know, sort of the the fast and there's always everyone wants, you know, tall, fast, physical, like the, all the, the traits. You want everything. Yep. But you usually can't have everything. But it, it felt like for a while, maybe the, the finesse was a, maybe a little bit more in. You wanted the speed. And I'm not saying that you can't win with that because clearly Miami's winning with a lot of speed right now. You look at a lot of the top teams around the league right now. Your San Francisco's, they're going to punch you in the mouth. The Philadelphia Eagles. They're going to punch you in the mouth. They're going to develop. They start on the trenches. Like the Eagles are such a phenomenal example of they start on the trenches, the offensive line, the defensive line. They develop those players. They draft those players. They even have enough of them. You know what they do? They draft more of them. And it's just like a, a constant steady stream of winning in those areas. And there's no perfect calculus to winning in the NFL. There's all different ways to do it. And it, it's always going to be some part of trench warfare. Like the, the trench is going to win a lot, but it does feel like the bigger, more physical, intense teams 
are the ones that are finding success right now. And it does feel like that Green Bay has been a little bit slower in transitioning back to playing that brand of football. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, I would say the, the pendulum does swing and the easiest way to look at it is like the Aaron Donald effect, right? Like everybody was big. Aaron Donald showed up and all of a sudden the best player in the world is, is under 295 pounds at defensive tackle. And that, that does, it goes back and forth. What you see now is you have 235 pound linebackers where those guys were big safeties back in the day. So you, you have, you have a reason to develop a running game, whether it's with a fullback, whether with, with multiple tight ends, whether you just got big nasty guys that can run, run block, it pays to develop that now because you literally have people at the second level, like Green Bay, quite frankly, that yep. cannot that cannot hold up and cannot fill gaps. And so right now, I think it is mission critical to find, and this isn't a body type thing. I think it's mission critical to find tough guys. Yeah. I just think every team needs multiple tough guys up, up front, offensive and defensive line. They're like, I'm gonna be that dude. Like, like Williams. The kid from the New York Jets had just got a, a ton of money, the defensive tackle. Quentin Dude, Williams, yep. If you saw that guy walking down the street, you're not thinking, man, that's like one of the top three defensive tackles in the world right now. You know, he's 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 not ripped. He's he's six foot two, two hundred and ninety-five pounds, three hundred and five pounds. He's a big dude, but he's not, he's super, super physical, he's super confident, he can shoot gaps, and he's got great technique. He's got great footwork. And there's just not enough of those guys to go around. So you're going to keep seeing, I think, I think this is going to last a long time is the trend's going to be find the behaviors, find the attitude, develop the technical, develop the physical, right? I, it it just this, makes too much sense. Does this team need a couple more assholes on it? Like, honestly, I, it, mean, it feels I think this, and I, I keep going back to this because I, I want to be real careful with my words. I, I would go to I, I would go to war with a lot of guys on that defense. I just think they they have the right stuff for me. Yeah, I, I know that might seem like blasphemy right now, but I feel like they have the right stuff from an attitude standpoint. The the vast majority of them, I think they're just being put in situations that they don't fully understand, right? And that and that's why they're losing. Um, offensively, this this looks to me like. Uh, yeah. This looks to me like a team that's probably really interested in what's on Instagram. You know, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but you know, you go back and like, like who is like you said, who's going to be the asshole? Who's who's getting grimy today? Like, yeah. who's going to get in a fight? Where's Where's TJ Lang when you need him? You know what I mean? Where's TJ, yeah. man? I need I. You need a guy. Who's going to be that guy? Mercedes Lewis wasn't that kind of guy, but he was that guy. Yeah, like, you're We're missing that dude more than you can admit you can imagine right now. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And we kind of had a feeling, especially from a Mercedes standpoint of like, you just need that. I know they try to use a literal sixth offensive lineman from time to time, but that guy had it and he led by example, which was always nice to see as well. Mike, clearly the, the follow-up question to what you're saying on defense is they've got the guys that you want to go to war with. The popular, uh, you know, immediate reaction and really has been now is fire Joe Barry. Mm -hmm. it, it's Joe Barry's fault. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle, but uh, clearly we've seen almost two and a half years of what this defense has accomplished or not accomplished. I don't think it's been up to expectations. I will say like whatever direction you want to go in, when you invest as much as the Packers have in one specific area of the football team, you have one of two things. It's the ingredients or it's the chef. Yep. And one of them has to sort of be wrong if, and it can be a combination of a little of both, of course, but like if you put all of these super expensive ingredients and spent a ton of money on it, you're going to want the chef to cook something good. And right now the chef's not cooking anything good. So did you buy the wrong ingredients or did you hire the wrong chef? But it feels like somewhere in there, it's not matching up. Yeah, certainly. And obviously, you know, having Jay Alexander out sucks. Having Eric Stokes out for this long Again, and not really even knowing what he's going to look like. Yeah. Like that's uh, those things are realities that we like to gloss over, but it is a big deal when you're losing your two top cornerbacks, you know, in this. I mean, Detroit Lions lost, you know, the, the Gardner Johnson's not playing last. Like the, these things happen, but they are a yeah. big deal. I think for me, when I watch it, like you could watch yesterday, for example, Rasul Douglas gets beat by the rookie Sam Laporta, who was my favorite tight end in the draft. I mean, he's a really good player. He's going to continue to be amazing. He gets beaten on a, on a route where 
you know, quite frankly, if they're, if they're going to bring down Darnell Savage to the three receiver side instead of trapping the backside guy like most teams would do, well, then he's going to get beat to the space. And that happened twice. Um, it happened most notably the one play before the touchdown, which everybody remembers because the soul fell down on a, on a stutter go. Right. So there, if you play man, because we play the most zone, if you play man like everybody wants, well, then they get beat. And you don't like that. Right. And if you play zone where they're playing too soft, and you don't like that. Where I have the like, I guess where, where I'm having issues is you, you, I can't remember a time where you've really had a pass rushing three technique. You really don't have one. I mean, Kenny Clark's a great player. He's not a pass rushing three technique. He's never had double digit no, attacks, right? He's just not that guy. So you've got one guy on your team that can rush the passer, and he's really good, but he's coming back off an ACL. But you've got one guy who can rush the pass. You have one guy, you, you know, John Kaminsky would start on the nickel in this, on this team. He would. He, he would he start. lifted Royce Newman last night, 10 yards into the backfield in the playoff. He, he's like, he's better yeah. than guys we have on a consistent basis for that specific job. And so you can't get home with four unless, unless Rashawn Gary it, 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 it turns into Superman. I mean, most of the time. And so you got to commit. You have like, those are real issues. From, that's a talent issue. Yep. But then you look at the run game and you go, we can actually do this. We should be able to do this pretty well up front. Like we got Devontae Wyatt, TJ Slayton, Kenny, Rashawn, Preston is amazing in the run. Like those guys are all really good in the run. You go, well, now if you're going to do what you're doing, you got to have linebackers that are filling and they're not filling. So no. there's, it's always like that's a scheme thing or a way we're teaching it thing. So I think on the one hand, you've, you're built for something that you're, you should be better at that you're not. You're actually awful at it right now. And then on the other side of it, Detroit can get home with four and we can't get home with four. So what has to give, you probably got to get a key position, three technique defensive tackle that can rush the passer. And then you got to teach those linebackers and those safeties to fill responsibly, you know, more often than not, you know, being, and be much more violent players. And if you get those things done, I think you have something there, but right now it just looks like the same old, same old every week. And I would say too, when we, when, you know, and I, I think there's plenty to criticize with Joe Barry and I'm certainly not going to be on the defend Joe Barry train. I think there's a, there's a lot of things that are going on here, but when you, we always say like, Oh, Green Bay has all these first round picks on defense. They should be so much better. When you have a first round pick, when you're spending a, a premium pick, and I know not all of them are going to turn out, but what you really want is you want somebody who can play the run and play the pass. You want the best of both worlds when you're getting that guy in the first round. Think of your Clay Matthews, your like whoever we want to insert here. Like you want those big time players. Mm -hmm. Darnell Savage, not great against the run, not great against the pass. He's a first round pick. That's more of a misevaluation, in my opinion. Eric Stokes is out in this game. He was never really good against the run anyway, but not he's out in this game. Jair sure. Alexander out in this game has not been playing the run very well. He's okay at it, but ever since the shoulder injury hasn't been the same. Not what he's ultimately paid for, but you get the point. Quay Walker has not been necessarily great against the, the run, and we just talked about some of the filling of the gaps. All right, Devontae Wyatt he shows some moments as a pass rusher, shows some moments as a run defender, but certainly isn't great at either of them. Lucas Van Ness is still a rookie. I think he's going to continue to develop. Rashawn Gary, you hit on that. I think he can play the run pretty well when he wants to. Obviously a really great pass rusher. But you didn't get a lot of these two-way play like players that can do both really good on offense and really good on defense. I know those players are tough to find, but like at some point, if you're coordinating and you have a bunch of players on your team that are good at kind of one or the other or not great at either, like you have to kind of either, and especially, and you mentioned it earlier, when you've got a, a, a team that because they're up, they have the whole playbook at their disposal and your offense can only go three and out, three and out, three and out, and you're just gassed and tired. Like there's only so much you can do in some of those situations. It's hard enough to play defense in the NFL when it's predictable for the other side and you know they're going to pass. When they have everything at their disposal, it's a nightmare. But they, they don't have a lot of guys that you know, all right, these guys are both good against the run and That's against the pass, point. and I can just keep them in there every single down and I can set it and forget it and not have to worry about it. Yeah, that's a great point. And even if when you look at Lucas Van Ness, like – I. 13th pick in the draft, and we'll see how he turns out. Certainly, he's a rookie, and he's got all, his whole life in, in front of him. Yep. But when you look at him, just when I look, when I put my offensive line glasses on, I go, "Well, okay, well, what's he? But but what's he really good at? Like, what did you? Is he? Because if he's unmolded clay, that you got to make into a really good one pass rush and runs defender, and he's just a really good athlete. 
then he's not a first round. He's not a 13th pick of the draft guy. And, and we'll see. And we've talked about this yeah. before. I think what you said that was super interesting, though, because you were just talking about how the Eagles built their defensive line. They continue to do it. We could have picked up the Eagles guy that, you know, this offseason was the best defensive tackle in the draft. We didn't pick him up. But you do have Savage. You do have Stokes. You do have – so, in other words, you, you have backloaded the defense, and you at some point have forgotten that the number one thing – like, I don't think anybody thought – Devontae Wyatt was the best defensive tackle at Georgia any, at any point in the last four years. No. Fair enough. Right. Probably so, the third, right? Probably the third best. Yeah. So probably probably the third or fourth best guy. So you pick him up. And again, this is one of those things where I like to tread lightly because I'm not talking bad about any players or where they got drafted. But what I am saying is if you don't have a guy who is going to be that dude at like the three technique. Right. If you don't have a guy that's going to be that dude to fill gaps at the linebacker position, and you're picking up guys that are like, well, they're they're hybrid athletes. There's there's they're super athletic. They can play in the passing game. They can do all these things. It's like you forgot what matters. What matters is can I physically move you from spot A to spot B when you don't want to be moved? And we don't have a lot of guys that you you can say that about. And I think that's the yeah. problem on both sides of the football. And and I would even go one step further and say. You know what? If they, it, it is tough to find a lot of those guys that are good at everything and that you can move around. It's, it's tough to find those guys. That's totally fair. But like, if you told me that this is a this is a defense that has loaded up on pass defense and Eric Stokes and Jair at corner and Darnell Savage at safety and Quay's going to be your you know super guy that can fly around the field as your pass defender and Rashawn and Van Ness and Wyatt and Clark. And those guys are just getting after the quarterback and every down and you're a phenomenal pass defense and it's third and eight, third and 10. And you just know we're getting off the field. We're pressuring the quarterback and it's, but like game on the line last week against the saints, it kind of goes under the radar. Saints have to pass going down the field. You just got the lead. You have all the momentum in the game. The Saints go right down the field. And I know yeah. that Corey Valentine's out there and it's not perfect. I get it. But like Saints go right down the field. It ends up being like, what, a 45-yard field goal for the win? That's going to get made far more often than not. And I know the defense was like not the major issue last week. But still, game on the line. You know they're passing. You got to get off the field. And they couldn't really do it. So I, I still don't even have the faith that if everything's in a perfect scenario, you know they're predictable and you have your best guys out on the field in pass defense. I don't feel great that this defense can even do some of that stuff. So I know that. I, I know that we haven't been we we haven't drafted in as good of positions because you win a lot of games. I'm just going to read you a couple names from Detroit Lions though, and I know that they you know that they got extra picks for for Stafford. Okay, Taylor Decker, first round pick, pretty good player. Yeah. Frank Ragno, first round pick, All Pro. Uh, Panay Sewell, first round pick, going to be an All Pro pretty soon. Going to be an All Pro, yeah. right? Uh, Jamar Gibbs, first round pick, looks pretty good to me. Right? Yep. You, OK, obviously, Jared Goff, Sam Laporta, second round pick, probably the best tight end in the draft for me. The guy that yep. can do it all already has great technique in the run game. Not he's not the biggest guy in the world, but technique wise, really, really, good. really, really good player. OK, go. Let's go to defense. Aiden Hutchinson, really good player, like not pretty good, really good really player. Good. Brian Branch, one of the, you know. He was one of the guys we identified for Green Bay being a guy that we were desperate to bring in. We were doing our shows in the in the in yep. March and April. Unbelievable player so far. Jack Campbell's going to be a stud on their team. I mean that that kid was two time Buckus Award winner for Iowa. Absolute unit. I mean, so you're just you look at their team and you go, where did they invest? Amon Ross St. Brown, fourth round pick. Josh Reynolds, free agent. Marvin Jones, free agent. Khalif Redmond, Raymond, excuse me, free agent or trade. You know what I mean? Start going, well, what are they in? What direction are they going in? The Eagles, where are they? You just start looking at like these teams. And again, the Miami Dolphins are maybe the outlier right now because they got four guys that run under four seconds flat. But, yeah. but everybody else, man, you are investing in dudes that can kick ass and take names up front. And I just don't know if we have those guys right now. And just to, just to bring it back full circle, because you bring up Miami as a part of this as well. And we'll see what ultimately, I think we'll get a great view of Miami this week against Buffalo, mm -hmm. a little bit different than Denver. So we'll see what that brings to the table. But as I mentioned earlier, there are different ways to build a championship contending football team. There's not just one simple, perfect way. And that's what the uniqueness of the NFL is. You get a different flavor of team every single week that's trying to do it maybe a slightly different way. And every year you get a champion that's maybe a little bit different. But 
you have to have some identity. You have to have some theme, something that you can rely on. In Miami, like you said, they got A-Chain, they got Mostert, they got Tyree Kill, they got Jalen Waddle, they got the track team to end all track teams. You just can't stick with them. They're just going to blow by you, and then you've got a mastermind on offense that is just going to figure out ways and scheme ways to just have somebody open at all time with a quarterback that's dynamically accurate and is going to find them if they are wide open and they are usually wide open. So like you've got something there and we've talked about the Niners and the Eagles and how they win. I don't, I don't necessarily care what it is, but you have to have it. And I don't know that green Bay has anywhere near in it on either side of the ball as of yet. And it's a young team. It's a developing team. And the hope is that they get it, but right now they don't have it and it shows. Yeah. And what do you think, if you were if you were to close your eyes and say in a year from now they have it, what do you think it is? See, that's where I think that's where the the struggle is from an organizational standpoint. Is I honestly can't answer that question because unless you have, unless you just we've had it, we've had a Christian, we've had a, a Devonte Adams, like you've had a Jordy Nelson, you've you've had all these guys, so you've had good wide receivers. Yeah, but what is what is that thing that's always been consistent? Was well, you've had elite level. Um, uh, quarterback play, but at least since I can remember, we've had elite, elite level offensive line play for the last 20 years. I mean, you think about when Sitton was there, Bakhtiari has been through two, two ton of these. Balaga, Corey Lindsley, Mike Flanagan, Marco, yeah. Tauscher. Ch- I mean, we've had dudes for so long and people took it for granted but now you're looking at like, man, our offensive line's not that good for the first. And I know like PFF ranked them high or something. But like, let's get real. You know what I mean? Like, we, it, we're, the tape doesn't lie. This isn't where you want to be. And can they get there? Zach Tom's a huge step in the right direction. Can yeah. they get there and get some guys, hopefully on both sides of the trenches, but guys where you're like, I need a yard. I know exactly where I can go to get it. Well, let, let's just like fast forward. We'll end on this, but like let's fast forward to next year. And you kind of mentioned, and let's just look at the offensive line. I feel good about Jenkins. I feel good about Zach Tom. Bakhtiari is a complete mystery box at this point. I, my guess is he probably played his last down in Green Bay. I've it, it, anyone's That's guess at this fair. point. Yeah. But um, Jenkins and Zach Tom are probably it. And I like Jenkins and Tom quite you know quite a bit. Um, they're really good offensive linemen, but that's. You, you probably want that as like your second and third best offensive lineman. And then I'm not sure you have a one, a four and a five. Um, Runyon will be a free agent. And I think he's had a really tough start to the year. I don't know how you felt about his play. Myers has been okay. Uh, it, I thought the first game was tough for Myers, but I, I haven't watched all of this one yet, but I thought weeks two and three were okay for Myers. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel great past that. We'll see what Rashid Walker can develop into first handful of snaps and this one didn't look super great when I first watched it but uh, um yeah I, I don't know where you go from an offensive line standpoint I do think offensive line running back and safety are going to be their first probable investments when they look at the draft next year and what they need for this team uh, but um yeah I don't know it's going to be interesting I don't know either I think you're right with uh you're probably right back to your right and, and, you know like I think you're right with Jenkins and Zach Tom if those guys are your top two in their current state Probably you know you probably need to go find another guy who's your, who's your top guy, yeah. um, and, and and I think Jenkins can fill that role of of enforcer to a certain extent. I think he became. I mean, the reason I think that people know who he is is because he gloved up Aaron Donald on one play, and and you know, they got into a shoving match, and that, I think that put him on the map. I mean, I think he's a good player, but I think there's those little moments that happen that kind of make people aware of who you are. And I think that's for him. That's that's certainly one of them. But he can be that guy. Um, but they do need they 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 need some guys who are just mean through the whistle dudes. Then then they need to be you, you need to make sure that if if Stenovich isn't in the room coaching those guys because they were so much better two years ago. Yep. I mean they just were. They were, you know I don't I, whoever's in there now I think it's Butkus. Or, but yeah, I don't know who, I don't know him at all and he might be a great coach. But Stenovich was they were just a better program. When, when he was in that room for the couple of years that he was. So I think it's mission critical to try to find some of just the right kind of guys. And then whatever that evolves to is going to be dependent on what Jordan Love is. Not what, yeah. not what Matt LaFleur's offense is and how Jordan fits into it, but what Jordan Love is and what that really looks like and how we utilize all the weapons so that he can maximize his talent. Because I think he is talented. 
and he seems to have a good demeanor. He seems to process well. But and this is this could be a throwaway game. This couldn't be a sign of bigger or worse things to come. This could be a throwaway game. This these things happen. They trust me. Yep. To put into St. Louis Rams a couple times, it happens. But when you just start looking at the the totality of the four games and what what this team really could be like right now at one and three, um, you know, you, you do have to think about. I would love to know what their play, what what kind of culture, what kind of identity, what is it exactly that they want to do. And then are they doing that maybe from a personnel standpoint, but, but Andy, are they doing that at practice? Like yeah. I, the, the thing that keeps coming back to me is are they, are they putting in the time from a preparation standpoint on the field, sweating it out, not in the film room, which is important, not in the meeting room, which is important, but are you putting the physical strain, resilience effort in to being like a, master of the basic footwork of your of your position hand placement uh route running all, like are you a master at that because if you're not this sport's too hard man there's there's too much going on you know it might be a throwaway game they've had one good quarter in the last nine quarters fourth quarter against atlanta was a nightmare they played the good in the fourth quarter against the saints the first three were a nightmare and for the most part there was some garbage time stuff that was okay when the game was out of hand in this one that was four quarters of bad football in this one as well so Saints, the Lions, one one quarter, the end quarter of the Falcons. That's one one out of your last nine quarters was even you know remotely good football. So good point. Um, hopefully it is a, a throwaway and it's a young team. One game in the next twenty three days or whatever it is, they got time to prepare for the Raiders. They'll have time to prepare you know uh, up until their next game after that. But th they're going to need uh, all that time to get some of this stuff right. Mike, uh, th these are always uh, therapeutic. It's always good to sort of just let it all out following the loss. We'll hopefully have uh, a lot more positive things to discuss next time you're on. But uh, tell everyone where they can find your incredible work, where we can follow you on social and anything else you're working on. Yeah, Mike Qual 68 on Twitter, Process to Perform on Instagram. Check out our Process to Perform channel on YouTube. That's where we do all the on my blog podcast stuff or you can get it anywhere on the Believe Network. So Andy, thanks for having me as always. Yeah, make sure to go follow his work. You can follow us here at Packaday Podcast. You can follow me at Andy Herman NFL. That's going to do it for us. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.